let's establish our baseline here. I'm going to, I'm going to go back and forth, share my screen, then go into the whiteboard, right? So just expect that. Let's do this, share screen real quick. This is how we do our market research. We see, okay, what are all the, what is all the material out there talking against velocity banking? So I gave you four videos, three YouTube channels, right? That you can look up. William Lee is a new person uh, that I've seen put out a, vi a video that velocity banking is a scam. Fluent in finance, he believes velocity banking is a scam. And Matt, the mortgage guy, believes velocity banking is a scam, doesn't work, right? That the numbers are, are false, okay? Uh, typically they're pulling their numbers from the velocity banking educators, right? So if you want this Word doc, just email me directly put in the subject line, velocity banking is a scam, doc, something like that. And I will send you this material, right? I will send you the Word docs that you can have all the research that you can do for yourself, okay? Here are the educators. Here are the velocity banking educators, people that are making content that are like case study like videos and they're breaking down all of the different elements of velocity banking, okay? You got Kana J. Wallace, the Velocity Channel. You got Mike Adams, Think Wealthy with Mike Adams. You got Christy Van, right, with Fantastic Finances. And you got myself, Denzel Rodriguez, Personal Finance Geek, 21st Century. I consider these people to be the best educators, right, on Velocity Banking, that they're breaking down all of the components of velocity banking. And I also put these people here because majority of their content is on velocity banking. Okay. So then below here are channels that cover velocity banking, promote it, advocate for it, or use it as an add-on strategy. So the reason why I separate the list here is because if you watch any of these people, they have other primary content that they're putting out. And then like every now and then they'll make videos on velocity banking, do a little case study. They'll share some things. They'll talk about the strategy. They'll talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, and in between. So it's not their primary purpose for having the YouTube channel, but it's one of the top things that they, they talk about, right? And they're for the concepts. So you got Quack Brothers, you got Matthew Pillmore, VIP Financial Education. You got Donnell, uh, what's it called? Self-Directed, right? You got Sebastian Boyer, the approved guy. Amanda Pride, it's a client of mine. Minor Ramos, another client of mine. Uh, you got Miss Robin, client of mine. Just became a client recently working with her. And then there are uh, three other YouTube channels. I don't know their names, so I just put their YouTube channel links, right? So that's the market research that I've done for you already. That's who is in the space, right? There's really there's a handful of people talking about Velocity Bank, right? Handful of us, not too much. Now, here's what I would say. Just a couple of things I think where velocity banking can improve, not necessarily for the edgy, not necessarily for the promoters and advocators, but putting more of the heat on on myself, on on Christy, Mike, Adams, Kana J, right? Putting the heat on on myself, right? And then the other velocity banking teachers and educators is to just simply say that, hey, we're, we don't need to oversell it or hype it up in general, right? And you know what? Yep, I'll, I'll throw these guys in here too. Some of them, you know, I don't think we need to hype it up. I'm not saying anybody is. I'm just saying that's where it can improve. I'm saying I've done it before. I'm saying I've oversold or hyped it up. So I'm putting myself on the spot. That's a way that I've been improving over the years. I know when I first came out, I was like just super pumped up with so much energy, right? That maybe there was, there was uh, videos that I've put out or cases that I've done where I clearly made mistakes, right? Maybe I was overly excited, um, didn't run the numbers. So that, that's just me being very, 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 very transparent with you. And also sharing that, look, if we go to my YouTube channel, I wanna share with you, this is just part of my growth. We go to playlists. I have a playlist on my YouTube channel called my my worst, most popular videos watched. Let me see, where is it? Where the heck where is it? Where is it? Oh, here we go. So if you check out this playlist, nearly every one of these videos, right? These are my most watched videos, but they're actually like there's in some of these videos have mistakes in them, errors. 
maybe I was overselling it. Um, maybe I didn't convey the message effectively. I, you know, just totally maybe bombed it in my personal opinion. But according to YouTube and, and you guys, you guys love these videos because they're my most watched videos, but they're my worst ones. Because if you, if you pay close attention, you're going to be able to spot some errors in some of these, some of these videos in this, in this playlist, right? So again, this, that's just me improving over the years, right? We're not all perfect. We're going to make mistakes. When we're doing a case study, we might make an error on some of the math here or there. What I've done in all of my case studies, right, is I create buffer space. I create room for error. So for example, if I'm working with someone that makes $5,200 a month base salary, right, net take home, and then they typically get five to 10 hours of overtime. So their income could be as high as 5,700. Typically, we're going off the $5,200 number, right? And then if they tell me that they spend $3,200, right? I typically will add a little buffer on there. So now I'm lowering the cash flow. I'm overestimating expenses. I'm underestimating on income, creating this entire space, room for error buffer in case I do make a mistake in the actual application of doing the concept, they're actually going to do much better, right? So that is critical. I think that's super, super important to be aware of. So I just want to share those things with you. Coming back to sharing the screen here. Another thing I want to say is that it's okay if velocity banking doesn't work for every situation. We don't have to force velocity banking in general. No need to force velocity banking. What do I mean by that? So example is using cash advances to pay off debt, paying unnecessary charges on credit cards to pay off debt, paying high balance transfer fees, when all of this can be avoided or greatly reduced in cost with a little extra patience and a little extra preparation. Shout out to the people that were with me last night when I was doing uh, Ask Me Anything Q&A, where you know, I talked to some of you in the comments and you're like, Denzel, he, I, I can't find a bank where the home equity line of credit is no less than 9%. I've looked at 10 banks, Denzel. I looked at five banks, Denzel. And all of the banks I looked at so far are only giving 9% home equity line of credit. And I, my simple response to them is, there's thousands of banks in the United States. You only looked at five of them. You only looked at 10 of them. You haven't even scratched the surface yet. Keep doing more research. It's not that hard. It takes you five minutes. It takes you 15 minutes. Matter of fact, I did a video on how to qualify the line of credit. And the length of that video, I think was about 40 minutes, about 40 minutes. That's me talking and explaining how to do the research. So in reality, if you actually did the research on your own, you probably do it in like 20 minutes. No matter what state you're in, in the United States, we can find a HELOC today in 2023 less than 9%. The prime rate is 8.25%. So the way I do velocity banking, mind you, there's other players in the space that also teach velocity banking in their own style, in their own way. My, my baseline of how I do velocity banking is I am looking for the cheapest way to do velocity banking. I'm looking for the most efficient way to do velocity banking. That's every single time, every single time, I'm always looking for the most efficient, cheapest, fastest way to do velocity banking. And if that requires me to wait a couple of extra months to do velocity banking, I'm willing to wait those extra months to get my credit score up, to get my DTI down, to make sure I answer, uh, get all my questions answered from that specific bank to make sure I have a relationship with the bank to make sure that I don't settle for a nine, 10% HELOC when there are clearly home equity line of credits in the space where you can get an intro rate at 3.99% for 12 months or an intro rate of 7%, 6% for the first six months, 12 months. And then it goes to 7.75%. So that's about a half a point below prime, right? instead of selling, settling for 11%. Like you're just, you're, you're adding extra work that we don't need to add. Same with cash advances. I know some people teach cash advance for velocity banking. I don't, I'm, I'm letting you know, like you should avoid cash advances as much as humanly possible because there's something called convenience checks. There's something called balance transfers. There's something called running bills through your expenses instead of, instead of 
trying to move one debt into a credit card and pay cash advance fees plus the balance transfer fee and get charged that daily interest until it's paid off and just get smacked over the head at 25% interest when we could have just got a PLOC at say seven, nine percent, right? So every case study that I'm working with is individual prescriptions and I'm always looking to reduce the the cost as much as humanly possible, find the most efficient thing that, that works for them. So that's the baseline, right? I'll go back to sharing my screen and now we're gonna look at the two content creators that we're gonna be analyzing, right? So I'll close that, close that, close that. So we look, we're gonna be looking at Christy Van, all right? And let me uh, make sure y'all can go to theater mode. <clears throat> so I'm looking at Christy Van, specific video. This is a, a client of mine, business partner. She's doing a phenomenal job. Look at this, over 66,000 subscribers. She's helping a ton of people out. So this particular video, was reviewed by this content creator, William Lee. So he took the same exact numbers in the first, I think, 10 minutes or so of, of the video. And then he goes, he goes into like a mortgage example. So I'm not gonna play the entire video here, but we're gonna we're gonna analyze he was reviewing what he was what he was talking about. And then we're gonna look at what Christy Van says and we're gonna learn and we're gonna make this happen. So first off Let's go, I'm gonna run this back it's right about there. I'll run this back. You know what, I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to like play the video. I don't know if there'll be any issues here. So I won't play the uh, the sound, I'll do that. I'll turn on captions and I'll see if that helps. Uh, then I'm gonna scroll into it. We're gonna blow this up so that you can see this thoroughly. All right, so his claim is that Velocity Banking is a scam. He used Christy Van to prove that using her case study. Christy Van is doing a case study to give you the context. Christy Van is doing a case study with someone making 5,200 a month and their cash flow is $0. So they have $0 in cash flow. So William Lee looked at that and he established a baseline, which I actually agree with doing. I think that's good. So he established a baseline. He ran the numbers on three debts. We have a truck loan. I'll zoom in on here. We have a truck loan at $7,000, 12% amortized. Payment is six forty four. dollars And he broke down the math in terms of what what you pay in interest. How quickly will it, will it be paid off? I don't know if his calculation is simple interest or, or amortized. So... I didn't, I didn't run the math on that yet, but I'm just going to rely on his expertise, right? And his understanding that, you know, a loan is, is amortized interest. So hopefully he recorded as 12% amortized. So he just ran it and he said, okay, look, if you just paid the monthly payment, cause that's all this sp specific person can do. They have zero cash flow. They're literally paycheck to paycheck. So they break even each and every month. So that means they can't pay in any extra money towards any of the debts that we displayed here. And he said that this would be paid off in 12 months, right? So 12 months for the truck loan, 13 months for this credit card. I know that's in the way, but it's a $1,500 balance and the interest rate is 21.325%. Monthly payments, a hundred bucks. If you kept paying it, it'll be done in thirteen months. And then there's a a loan here for three thousand five hundred. Interest rate is twenty eight percent. Monthly payment two eighty four, and that'll be paid off in thirteen months. So the baseline, doing nothing, doing nothing, but just paying the bill on time each and every month. This will be paid off. All of their debt will be paid off in thirteen months. Okay, so. The reason why he calls Velocity Banking a scam is because Miss Christy Van here, according to her video, says that to pay off $12,000 with zero cash flow within 10 months. Is that not an attractive title, right? To like click on, that's why I got 52,000 views, right? And that was five months ago. So in 10 months, she is claiming that somebody with zero cash flow can pay off $12,000 in debt. So what she establishes here, cancel that put the captions on here let me see if she gets if she moves to that side okay perfect so she is showing the credit card balance 1500 bucks right y'all see that 1500 dollars. the truck seven thousand dollars 
she is factoring in a 4% balance transfer fee. And she uses the word convenience check. That is a critical, critical detail. If you watch William Lee's video, he's saying that Christy Van is telling this client to do a cash advance. So he's saying that Christy Van told this, this person, this case study, to do multiple cash advances to pay off multiple loans, right? The two loans, stick them into the credit card. If that were the case, if Christy Van actually said that, I would pull her to the side offline. I would set up a call and I'd say, hey, that that particular video where you said cash advance for this person, um, you would have been better off letting that client do either a balance transfer on a 0% credit card and pay like a two to 4% balance transfer fee or, or convenience check, right? But we don't want to do the cash advance because if you do the cash advance on 7,000 and 3,500, they're going to get charged interest immediately rather than the interest accumulating until the due date. They're going to get charged compounded interest at a higher interest rate than 21.325%. But Christy Van did not say that, right? She did not say that in the video. She said, this client is going to do a convenience check, two of them, one convenience check for $7,000, one convenience check for $3,500, and you will pay a 4% balance transfer fee on the 7,000, 4% on 35. She ran the math and said, boom, you're going to owe $12,420, right? So clear on that. So now that's a critical detail because William Lee is under the assumption that this is a cash advance. So any math he displays after this point in time is going to be based off cash advance interest costs. And that's where the math separates. I'm going to stop and I'm going to look at some questions real quick. Do we understand? <clears throat> Put in the comments if you understand that cash advance interest and convenience check interest is calculated differently on a credit card, right? It is not the same. I'm having trouble with my little arm here. It keeps going up. So cash advance interest charges you the interest the moment you pull money out of the credit card. So now you're getting charged a higher interest rate. So let's say your credit card interest rate is 21.325%. On cash advance, it'll be a couple points higher than that. It might say 26.99%. So you're getting charged a higher interest rate. And not only are you getting charged a higher interest rate, you're being charged 26.99% daily, right? So it's it's split up. Or you do 26.99, you can divide it by 12, right, to, to get the actual uh, daily interest per day. And that interest is actually being added to your balance. So by 12 o'clock a.m., you're going to see that interest added to your overall balance. So if you owed $12,420 on your credit card and you did cash advance, at the end of the day, you'll owe, say, $12,485. So you got charged $8.50 at the end of today. So that means tomorrow you're getting charged 26.99% on $12,485.50, not the original balance. So it's gonna be compounding daily. That is, that's very hard to pay off that kind of debt, very hard. Versus convenience check, which Christy Van said in the video, you, you do the 7,000 pay off the truck, do the 3,500 pay off the loan, right? The only charge we're getting is that 4%. So it would be $420. So that gets added to the overall balance. Now I owe $12,420. I'm going to stay at 21.325% interest. I'm going to stay at that rate. And then by doing velocity banking, by dumping a portion of my income in, not all of it, if you watch the video, you'll see how he says that the client is dumping all their income in all at once, right? He, he, he makes a point that, he makes a valid point that with Chrissy Van's videos or that one specific video that we're assuming that the client is dumping in all their income at once, which is not the case. And again, in Chrissy's video, she did not say that. She showed the math of 12,420 minus the cash flow gain of no longer making those monthly payments along with bills that can 
be paid with a credit card and that is getting deposited into the credit card. Now what's cool about it is within the cycle, within the statement cycle, it doesn't matter when she, when they get the money into the um, line of credit. Oh, you know what? Mm -mm, that's not right. It does matter. It does matter when the money goes in, right? So that's a valid point from William Lee's perspective is that if you're saying that the person's income is going in all at once, that is going to make a difference in terms of what we pay in interest versus if the income is getting deposited into the credit card two or three times throughout the month, that's going to change the interest cost. So he is correct about that. Now, what Christy Van did, what I noticed, the way she calculated the interest, I think she had she had ran it based on you getting charged interest on the full balance of, of what's owed. And the thing is, when you do a convenience check and when you have debt on a credit card, depending on when the money went in and as it came out, you're only going to get charged interest on a portion of the balance, right? So we'll come to the whiteboard here so I can illustrate that. And then I'm going to look at your questions. So here's the thing. <clears throat> here are the debts, right? William Lee said cash advance. Christy Van said convenience check. There's a there's a big difference there in costs, so that changes the math. Here's how you calculate credit card interest on a credit card. You do 21.325%, you divide by 12, you're gonna get that number. You times that number by the balance owed, 12,000, right? 420. In a 30-day period, you'll you'll uh, pay $220.71 if, if you didn't do anything, but just kept the balance there, right? So what Christy Van did was she Calculate the balance on the highest balance, the lowest balance, ending balance. So highest balance, lowest balance, ending balance. She did her math. Then I, the number I got was 196.57. Her number was like 189. And then if you look at William's video, uh, the interest was 183. So his interest is actually lower than mine and Christy Vans. And I will submit to you that all of our interest calculations are wrong. William Lee's interest calculation is wrong, mine is wrong, and so is Christy Van's interest calculation wrong. The reason why they're all wrong, including myself, number one, Christy Van is overestimating. I overestimated William Lee. He actually came the closest, which was his number was 183. It's actually going to be less than 183 moving forward. And here's why, right? Here's why. Let's say that the credit card that we're gonna move debt into, the due date, due date, let's just say it's the first of every month. Let's say the closing date is the fourth. If Christy Van was talking to the client, she, I, she, I don't think she, she didn't cover it in the video, but I'm pretty sure offline with the client, she's informing them when to move the truck and move the loan into the card. Now, the most efficient time to move another debt into a credit card is after the closing date, after the closing date, because now you just bought 25 more days where you're not going to get charged interest because the way interest works from month to month on a credit card is we're only getting charged interest on whatever the statement balance is owed. So we're in July right now, right? And they owe, let's say $1,500 on the credit card. So that means on August 1st, they're only being charged 21.325% on 1500 owed. So when, so it is the, what's today? Today's the 15th, right? So today's the 15th, July 15th, okay? If they moved 7,300 today, July 15th, they will not get charged interest on August 1st. They will not. So, what that means, ladies and gentlemen, is that when the income plus the cash flow, so portion, see their income is $5,200, that's their total income, they spend $5,200. 644, 100, 284 are the three payments that we're removing. It's July 15th. In their expenses, they calculated 1,028 of new cash flow, that's in her video, and then the difference is expenses. So it was like 2,000 and some change. Of expenses. So now between July 15th and August 1st, she removed the payment of the $100. So she's not going to owe $100 on August 1st because 3228 would have gone in from July 15th to August 1st, 
right? Roughly, let's just say that was the case. So 3228 went in and then expenses came out. This client would still only get charged interest on $1,500. And then after the closing date on August 4th, from that point in time to September 1st is when I finally will get started. Will I get charged interest on the remaining balance of the credit card? So that first month, I said 196. Again, Christy did like 189. Williams 183. We're all wrong, right? I established the cost. If you did nothing, not even made a payment, you'd, you'd get charged uh, 22071. And then doing velocity banking, uh, this this calculation is is assuming that we owed 12,420 for 10 days, 9,192 for 10 days and 11,581 for 10 days, you'll get 196.57. That's not what's happening. So some key takeaways here is you're not being charged on the whole balance when you move debt into a credit card based on the timing that you do it, that you can avoid getting charged interest on the whole balance and you can buy extra time, okay? The other thing that Christy Van didn't talk about, which I thought was interesting, and maybe she just left it out on, on, on purpose just to show what it would look like without cashback rewards. So the charges that were running through the credit card, I would assume that that credit card is giving something cashback rewards, 1%, 1.5, 2% maybe. In her video, we didn't account for cashback rewards. Understand that cashback rewards applied to the statement balance each month before the before the due date is going to decrease your interest costs even further, right? And then what I mentioned here, depending on when the money goes in and out, it will change the results. So being 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 very slick as to when we pull expenses out, ideally you want to run your bills after the closing date before the due date. So you're going to be consistently buying more time and now we're only getting charged 21.325% on a portion of what's owed. Whereas when you look at his math on William Lee's video in, in his math, the interest is being charged on the whole entire 12,420 compounded, right? Because he's assuming cash advance charges. So in his math, he's technically correct based on cash advance. Christy, Mas Christy Van's math is correct based on convenience check. So you can see the, the differences here. That's, that's critical, that's very, very important.